Today, uh, we are wrapping up our series, Family Matters, because you know what? Family matters. And, and, and a lot of you have uh, uh, some different things and different dynamics in your family. You've had some ups and some downs, some good times and some bad times, and, and maybe some ebbs and some flows. And maybe there are some relationships that have deteriorated. I, I, here's, here's what I know, that, that there are sometimes things need a little bit of reassembly. Uh, you know, as a father or just as a newlywed, you often have no money. And so you buy furniture that has a, a, a wonderful statement printed on the side of the box that says, some assembly required, right? You've been there and you start building this stuff. And when they mean some assembly, they mean like you're not having to harvest your own wood. That's about the extent of the non-assembly that's going on. And you get like all the little tools and you build this whole thing. And you're like, I literally just became a furniture builder today. Like I might as well open my own shop. You just drop off the wood and now I'm not, right? So you have these things that like, I've had to assemble bikes before. And I just want to say, thank the Lord. I've never had to reassemble a bike before because that would have been terrible if my kids are like going down and like, and it just falls apart. And I'd be like, your mom did it. I don't know what happened. She was up late building that for you. And so there's one time, so I, I've, I have ventured into the world of kind of furniture making a, a couple of times in my life. And so I've, I, I have a coffee table that we have at our house. Well, it's in storage right now because we don't have a house, but I have a coffee table that I made and I, I, I made it in our garage and all this stuff. And when I first made it, it had three legs. It was like this mid-century modern looking thing. It had these wooden like, uh, like spoky legs and they were really cool and all this stuff. And I put three legs on it because two legs wouldn't work. Um, some of you will pick up on that later. Like, why not? <laughs> It'll fall, okay. So I put three legs on this table and, and, and it looked great. And I realized that one, I used some cheaper legs and it didn't hold real well, but it quickly became unstable. And so we had small children at the time. So it gets bumped into, it gets hit, it gets drug across the living room floor because you got to make room to wrestle, right? Like all of these things. And it's just kind of gotten, it got beaten up over time. And so when we moved uh, from Midlothian up to Dallas, I decided it was time to reassemble that table. So I took all the legs off of it and I decided it was time to go to four legs and not three legs. Like four is going to be a little stronger, a little more sturdy. And I got new legs that are metal legs and they're kind of these, these hairpin legs. And, and I flipped it over and I measured it out, marked it all up and I put the new legs on, turn it over. And the thing is rock solid now. Like it is well done, it is well made, but it required some reassembling. At first, it was good. We loved it. it. It did its job. It was great. But over time, it kind of got loose, and it was shaky, and it wasn't solid, and it wasn't what it needed to be. People would kind of put their feet on I remember one time my dad put his feet on it before, and it, like, it was just at the right angle, and the whole table was like, huh? And I was like, no, stop, Dad. You can't do that. Let me turn it for you so you can put your feet over the leg. Then it's stable, and he's like, you, you didn't do a great job on this. And I was like, we'll get there, right? And, and we fixed it, and now I'm like, hey, Dad, throw your feet up on that bad boy. It's not going anywhere. But it had some reassembling. And this morning, I know that there are relationships that you have gone through and relationships in your family that have maybe crumbled and deteriorated. And you're looking at them and you're going, you know, there is some reassembly required in this relationship. Here's what I've learned about relationships. If, it, if it, the words from a family member cut deeper than the words from a friend or coworker. And there are some relationships that are friend relationships that feel like family, and I understand that. But let's say you come up to me today after service, and you're like, Pastor Ryan, that message was absolutely special, but not special in a good way, Pastor Ryan. That was especially bad. That was like the worst message I've ever heard from you, and I don't know why you even preach. And I would go, man, that hurts. But you know what? By tomorrow, I'd be over that. If Lauren came up to me and said those very words to me, she hasn't ever. I don't think she would. But let's say she comes to me, and she's like, Ryan, why are you, pre like, that's terrible, that's awful. It would take me a long time to get over those words because family cuts a little bit deeper. If my sons were to come and be like, dad, you're terrible, I would go, I need to fix something. Like, like there would be a deep-seated hurt that, that would come from that. And, and now they're gonna say that out of spite because I just said that because they have too much of their father in them. But we find that sometimes in our family relationships that there are moments and things of true hurt and words that have been said that have caused there to be a, a root of either bitterness or just a deep-seated wound that lives in us. And yet the love that we have for that family member, for that person tells us and, and draws us to say, man, I wanna reconcile that relationship. I wanna reassemble this relationship. This morning, I want to talk about forgiveness and reconciliation. And I've titled this message, Some Reassembly Required. 
Because not every relationship is going to be perfect. Not every relationship is ever going to live and work the way you want it to. There will be ebbs and flows and ups and downs. There will be hurts. And, and I know this for a fact. I've looked at my own life, and I have not gotten any relationships perfect. I have messed up. I have said things where, where I needed to be forgiven. I have done things that have required me to acknowledge and to own it and to go back and ask for forgiveness. I, I've, I have been on the other end of it. I have been hurt, and, and I've had others come and ask for forgiveness. I've had to give forgiveness and then had to work to reconcile that relationship. But I think when we look at Jesus as the the ultimate example of what it means to live out a life of forgiveness and reconciliation, what we see him as, and now hear me, I understand the easy thing for me to do would be to stand up here today and say, everybody go live like Jesus. And we're like, yeah, I think that's the idea. We get that. Like that's the most pastor thing I could ever say is like, well, just be like Jesus. Just be like Jesus. But when we talk about forgiveness and reconciliation, Jesus is the greatest example that we have of forgiveness and reconciliation. And our desire then is to try to live and look like Jesus in our relationships. And I understand that it's way easier said than done. But yet, we have to have the desire for reconciliation. We can either fight for revenge or for reconciliation. We could either fight to get even or to reconcile. And I want you to know this, that in your families and in your life, that the devil wants nothing more than to destroy your home. He wants nothing more than to destroy your marriage and to destroy your family and to attack the very values that we see in the word of God for your family and in your home. He wants to disrupt relationships between father and son and father and daughter and mother and son and mother and daughter. He wants to bring corruption and he wants to destroy the very fabric of your home and of your family. But can I tell you this morning, you have a say in the matter. You don't have to sit back and just say, this is just what it is. This is where the chips have fell. And so we're just going to have to live and navigate it as it is. But no, you actually have a say in the matter. That you don't have to sit back and allow the wounds and the hurts and the past uh, mistakes and problems to define the future of your family but that there is the opportunity to move forward. There's an opportunity for forgiveness and for reconciliation. And in fact, Jesus is the greatest example of that. He's the greatest example. And again, this is an easy subject to talk about. We can talk about forgiveness and reconciliation all day long, and we can talk about, hey, you need to go and do this, and you need to do, and I understand that it is a totally different thing when, I've, when the rubber hits the road, when you actually have to fulfill and walk it out and live it out, but, but the reality is we are called to this as believers because I want you to understand this. First and foremost, we're disciples of Jesus. First and foremost, we are disciples of Jesus. A disciple, as you look at it in, in Scripture, it was, was somebody who sat under the teaching of a rabbi, and not only that, they would try to then mimic the way that person lived and to do and live the way they were taught to live as according to that rabbi. So Jesus has his disciples, and they followed. John the Baptist had disciples, and they followed and lived as John the Baptist did, and they probably all smelled really bad. So no offense, I've just I've read the story and I'm like, ah, they're pretty dirty people. But Jesus had his disciples and he tells them, hey, you, you know, there's, there's a way to know that you are my disciple in John 13, 35. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. The key indicator, the marker that we have of being a disciple of Jesus is how we love. The way, they, the, the way we love our, our neighbors within the church, the way we love our family member, the way we love our coworker, that is the indicator and the marker. The world outside of the church is not looking to determine which denomination or which persuasion has the best or the most correct theology. No, they're looking to see if the followers of Jesus truly love like Jesus. They're not going, hmm, is it the Charismatics or the Baptist? Is it the Anglicans or the Methodists? Who no, no, that is not the mindset of the world around us. What are they looking at? They are looking to see, do those that claim Jesus live and love like Jesus? He says, this is how they will know you're my disciple. If you, by, by the way, you love one another. So that needs to be our, our marker, our indicator that we walk in love. And so how does Jesus 
love. And so understanding the way Jesus loves is crucial. It's vital in our understanding if we're going to truly live out a life of reconciliation. In Philippians 2, Paul writes this in verse 8, and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So how does Jesus love? He died for us, but why? For forgiveness and reconciliation. The indicator of his love for us was that he gave his life for our forgiveness. That we could come to Jesus, that we could put our faith and our trust and our belief in Jesus. We could proclaim him and confess him as Lord and Savior and proclaim and, and confess his death and his resurrection. And in that, we step into his grace and his mercy. We are clothed in his righteousness, right? We receive forgiveness, but that forgiveness, because see, our sin separates us from the Father. And so through that forgiveness of Jesus, we are then reconciled to the Father. This is the work of Jesus. This is why he he went to the cross, right? His love compels him to the cross for our forgiveness and our reconciliation. And so as we live and love as Jesus did, as the indicator to the world that we are disciples of Jesus, we are called then into a life of forgiveness and reconciliation. And I understand this today that some of you in this room have very serious and real pain and hurt in your life. By no means and at any point today am I going to try to belittle that or to tell you to just buck up and get over it. My heart is this, that we begin to adopt a heart of Jesus. And we'll talk through these things and go with a better understanding of how to approach certain things and, and when to realize. There, there's a difference between, because here's the other thing we have to realize as we walk into this today. There is a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. They are two different things. They are two different things. So we have to have an understanding. Here's my heart today. My hope today is this, that we'll come to the conclusion that we will determine this way, that I will make the next move no matter who made the wrong move. I will make the next move no matter who made the wrong move. If it was me, man, I need to own it. I need to step up and I need to ask for forgiveness. If it was them, I can still step into a heart of forgiveness. So I'll make the next move no matter who made the wrong move. So forgiveness and reconciliation, they're two different things. So first of all, today, let's look at forgiveness. Forgiveness leads to more forgiveness. Forgiveness leads to more forgiveness. And here's what you have to understand. Forgiveness is a choice that I make. I choose to forgive them. Whatever the wrong is that has happened, I have the choice to forgive or to allow bitterness to grow and take root. I get to make that decision. Jesus tells us in Luke 6, 38, he says, give and it will be given. He's talking about forgiveness. He's talking about a few other things, but he's talking about forgiveness. He says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. So what is Jesus saying? If you become a forgiving person, guess what you're going to receive? Forgiveness. He says, forgiveness leads to more forgiveness. And as you begin to walk in forgiveness, how many of you know that there are times in our lives we need forgiveness? How many of you want to walk in that where you go, you know what, man, I want to be a forgiving person because I will mess up at some point in time. Do I want to? No, that's not my heart. My desire isn't to be like, you know what, I haven't messed up in a good while. Let me go yell at somebody for a moment and say a very hurtful, no, 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 no. That's not our desire in our heart. But at some point, we will mess up at some measure, at some level. And Jesus says, if you forgive, the, the measure in which you use it, it will be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running up. That, that's like an abundance. It's like, here's what you gave. We're going to squeeze that down. We're going to press it in. We're going to shake. We're going to fill it, and it's going to run. Like, you will receive more forgiveness, right? There's this understanding that forgiveness leads to more forgiveness. And so I choose to forgive. I give that, I have that decision and that right. I cannot choose for somebody else to forgive me. I can't make that decision for them. I can't go and be like, hey, you really need to forgive me. And they can give me this half-hearted, not really meaning it, just like, okay, well, fine, uh, I forgive you. 
that didn't change anything in their heart. It just got me, it just got them to say the words. I'm like, there we go. Now I feel vindicated. I feel better. No, no, no. But I can't choose for others, but I can choose for myself to forgive somebody. And here's the encouragement in this. I don't always have the strength and ability to forgive somebody. I'm not going to stand up here and be like, I walk as the embodiment of forgiveness. If you harm me, I just, you are forgiven. No, 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 no. I'm human, as we all are. And so there are moments and times when things happen, words are said, that I need the help and the work of the Holy Spirit, amen, to be able to be strengthened to come back and say, God, in my own strength, I can't forgive them. In my own ability, Lord, I don't have it in me. My flesh says they're not worth it. And Jesus says, come on, let me strengthen you. Because I promise you, he, he, he wants forgiveness to be a part of who we are as a, as a mark and example of our love as his disciple. And so the Holy Spirit strengthens and builds us up and says, forgive them. And you're okay. But only by your spirit, God, am I able to do this. So you're not alone. You're, you're not doing this. In your, yes, you make the decision. You open yourself. You allow the Holy Spirit to strengthen. You say, Holy Spirit, I need you. And he wants to. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to give you what's needed to be able to walk in forgiveness. And Jesus says that when we walk in forgiveness, we open the door to then receive forgiveness. So that when the time comes and forgiveness is needed, forgiveness is given because we're going to sow the seeds of forgiveness and later reap a harvest of forgiveness. There is a need. And I hear me. Some of you have endured and walked through traumatic and hard things. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those in a moment, but, but I want you to know that forgiveness only comes in those situations through the healing power of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Lord to empower you to be able to forgive. So from forgiveness, we can start the work of reconciliation. Today I want to do, I want to teach a little on forgiveness, teach a little on reconciliation, and then can we get practical for a little bit and talk about how to do this? Because it's, it's, it's more than just being like, all right, now go do it. Like, I, I want to be able to give you some tools uh, to walk away with. And then we're going to take time, just to let you know where we're going. We're going to take time that if you go, you know what, I need to forgive some people, but I don't have the strength to do it, to allow the Holy Spirit to strengthen and empower. And we're just going to respond and say, if, if you need to forgive and you need to start there and you need the Holy Spirit to help you, we're going to take the opportunity to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give us strength. Amen? Amen. Listen, go ahead, be, and, and here's the why. Because we believe in relationships, we believe in family, and we believe in the power and the work of forgiveness in the Holy Spirit, amen, and that he wants to reconcile. So the second thing is this, reconciliation is our calling. Reconciliation is our calling. It, 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 here's the deal. Reconciliation means to restore friendly relations between. It does not mean to create complete uniformity. You can be reconciled to people you have disagreements with. It just in the same way, forgiveness isn't saying that what they did didn't happen or what they did wasn't wrong. It's not acknowledged, and it's not changing our mindset about the hurt that came. It's just saying I'm no longer going to allow them to to have that over me. I'm not going to let them. I'm not going to. I'm going to cancel their debt. We'll talk about that in a second. But but reconciliation is not saying we now walk in complete uniformity and complete unity into the depths of relationship that we've never had before. But but reconciliation is we're going to restore friendly relations between to be able to be friendly again. You probably have family relationships or, or, or even other relationships that you've walked into that there has been hurt and there has been pain and there used to be a, a, a level of friendship within that relationship that you were, you were friendly towards each other and there was uh, some, some common ground and, and you enjoyed one another and you hung out and it was great, but then something happens and the relationship is broken. Reconciliation simply says, can we at least just get back to being friendly towards each other? Because you have those relationships where you're like, man alive, I'm not looking forward to family reunion because that person's going to be there. And it's going to stir up the past hurts. It's going to stir up my anger. And it's going to, I'm not going to be in a good mood. And if I show up, it's not going to end well, right? The goal in reconciliation is to say, you know what? I can go to family reunion and not flip my lid because this person's present. Reconciliation says I can go to family reunion. And because I truly do love them as a family member, I can truly say, I'm glad to see you. I can hug them and I can move on if I have to. 
But it means that there has now been reconciliation. We can be friendly towards each other once again. And here's what, aren't you thankful this? Jesus prioritizes reconciliation over resolution. And, and here's what I mean by that. Because reconciliation says, okay, we're going to create, if it was resolution, we wouldn't find ourselves over and over and over saying, God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. Or having to ask others for forgiveness, right? Because if it was resolution, if it was resolute, then, then Jesus would say, I have come, I've given forgiveness, and, and, and you are now resolutely perfect. You are not just in the process of sanctification. You are essentially glorified. You are no longer walking in sin. It is complete resolution. And so Jesus says, I prioritize reconciliation over resolution. Like the process of sanctification is a work, and it's an ongoing, and it is a cleansing, and a reforming, and, and, a, and a, a shaping process that we walk through. And so his idea and his process is, we're looking towards reconciliation, especially in this context, person to person, as we're going, we want reconciliation. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be perfection in a moment. But just as Jesus says, I'm going to reconcile it to the Father, and we are this continued work in progress, it'll be the same in our, re- in our relationships, in the work of reconciliation. So if you've not sinned since you've been saved, first of all, wow. Um, you are the only one in the room. Uh, but that's not the way God operates. He reconciles us to the Father and then works on us in this process of becoming like Christ. Paul tells us that since we've been reconciled, we should then work in reconciliation. Here's what he says in 2 Corinthians 5.18. He says, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, catch this, the ministry of reconciliation. How many of you know that you are called into the ministry? It may not be full-time. Some of you may be called into full-time ministry, and the Lord is saying, hey, you need to step into full-time ministry, and we need to walk in that and and, and pursue what it means, and how how do we get into full-time ministry? But we are all called into the ministry of reconciliation. And first and foremost, that is that we should be pointing others to Jesus, right? That we should be pointing people to Jesus so that they too can be reconciled to the Father, right? So that they too can find the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to the Father. But we also walk in the ministry of reconciliation and that we want to work to reconcile relationships. That we want in our own life, we want to work to reconcile so we have forgiveness and that starts here, and then we have reconciliation, and that is then there to the other person. So we walk through this as we move from one phase to the next. Because the hope today is this, that I will make the next move no matter who made the wrong move. So as we allow the Holy Spirit to work on us, we make the next move. So what does that look like? I want to give practical steps today. Just simple groundwork laid, and then how do we live this out? How do we carry this out? Because it is so easy, like I said, to talk about it. It is a whole other thing to actually carry it out and to live it out. It's a whole different thing to be like, okay, what do I do? So here's how we do this, and and we're going to reassemble relationships. Step one is this. Adopt the mindset of Jesus. Adopt the mindset of Jesus. Romans 12 says, you know, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so as we walk in the mindset of Christ, what is the mindset of Jesus? It says, first of all, I love them. I love them. And so because I love them, I, I want to forgive them. So that's the first thing. And, and we have to understand the mindset of Jesus causes us to choose between do I want to mend this relationship or do I simply just want to get even in this relationship? Do I want to bring healing or do I, I, I want to, uh, you know, settle the score? Am I trying to be victorious? Is, is vengeance mine, saith Ryan, or is, do I trust the Lord? And I, and I just simply just ask, Lord, give me the heart to forgive. So the first thing is we adopt the mindset of Christ. As a part of being a believer, we walk in this idea of, I, I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus. So how do we, do we begin to take on the mind of Christ, especially in our relationship towards others? So where we say, man, you hurt me, you wronged me, but the mindset of Christ says, I love you, and I want to forgive you. The second thing is this, step two, give thanks for how much God has forgiven you. This is where heart change begins to happen. When we begin to bring our gratitude and our thanksgiving unto the Lord, we begin to have a softened heart before the Lord. And in that, we become pliable. See, part of reconciliation is empathy uh, for what it's like to not be at your best. And when we stop and we recognize, man, God, you've given me so much forgiveness. Your mercies are new every morning, and Jesus, I need them every morning. 
and you begin to frame and realize, man, I'm an imperfect person. I've messed up too. And start by just saying, we take the mind of Christ, and then we say, Lord, let me be thankful for your forgiveness. Let me walk in things. And that's step three, forgive. Let's talk about this for a minute. These first three steps do not require interaction with the other person, none whatsoever. They probably require a lot of prayer and a lot of talking to Jesus. When we say forgive, here's what you do. First of all, acknowledge the debt. A wrong has been done. You have been hurt. There is a debt of some sort that you are carrying in your heart and your life because of somebody else's actions, words, or, or, or whatever has happened. So you have to acknowledge it. You can't forgive what you haven't acknowledged as, as hurt and, and wrongful doing. If you just simply are like, it just is the way it is. It's just the way it is. And, and, and some of us, we've lived in that mindset. And we're like, oh, that's just how they are. The reality is you may be carrying a debt from them that, that needs to be forgiven. So you acknowledge it in the first place. You acknowledge the second part to forgiveness is you cancel the debt. You cancel the debt. And so you wipe it clean. You say, you know what? They, no longer do they owe me anything. No longer do, they, do I feel like they have to pay me something in this. I cancel the debt. When, when Jesus goes to the cross and he takes on our sin, he who was not sin became sin, right? He takes our sin. He goes to the cross. You know what he's doing? He's paying it. He is canceling our debt. So then we are simply just given forgiveness, right? And as disciples trying to be like Jesus, this is a hard part of the process. When we, when we try to understand it in the sense of the sins that we did caused us to be in, as in, in enmity towards the Lord. We were enemies of God. We were separated from the Lord. It is a, an egregious kind of act that we did. Our sin is awful. It is ugly. It is dirty. And Jesus says, I will forgive you. And in the same way as disciples, we try to take on this heart. We take on the mind of Christ. We thank the Lord for his forgiveness. And then we forgive. And forgiveness happens here. I, I want you to understand that forgiveness is an internal pro, uh, posture of the heart. To say, God, help me to forgive them. To release the debt that they owe me. And to say, God, no longer do I carry the weight of the hurt that they did. That doesn't say that what they did wasn't wrong. I, I want to make that clear. Forgiveness is by no means changing our mindset towards what was done. What they did may have been a horrible thing. And nothing is, forgiveness is not justifying what they did. It is simply saying that what they did no longer carries a weight over me. No longer is it a debt that, that I feel that they owe me. This is not something we do naturally. Fair? This is not something that we just go, you know what, today I'm just going to forgive every horrible, awful thing. That was, you may have been in an abusive relationship, you have verbally or physically or even sexually abusive relationship. Those are egregious, awful, horrible, terrible acts. By no means do we minimize or, or, or say, you know what, just forgive them and move on. No, 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 no. Understand, this is a deep work of the Holy Spirit on your heart. And there is this step in this action, in this process that is so hard to cross over sometimes where you have to process, how do I forgive what I can't forget? How do I forgive what is constantly living and playing in my mind? This is only a work of the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear me. If you're stuck in a spot where you're like, I just can't release and let, the, let this go, I can't forgive. I am not gonna condemn you. I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you, get your act together, get it, you know, come on, what's the deal? Buck up, walk with, no, no, no. My, my desire for you today is to lean into the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, help me in this hurt. Move me closer towards forgiveness because I'm gonna make the next move no matter who made the wrong move. And that doesn't mean you have to go to that person yet. You don't have to say anything to them. Forgiveness can happen simply in your heart that you live free of the debt. Step four, this is important. Determine if this relationship should be reconciled. Can I tell you, not every relationship needs to be reconciled. Is that fair? Do we have the heart to, to love people? And Yes, that is our desire. But there are some people who simply are not going to change unless the Lord intervenes and it is a miraculous work of God. Amen? Fair? We love them. We can give forgiveness without conversation. We can settle forgiveness in our hearts so that we're not walking in bitterness, so that we're not walking with the weight of the debt that they have caused in our lives, but we are free from that. But we can determine, is this relationship worth reconciling? 
And, and, and here's the deal. You want to reconcile relationships you can trust. And, and trust is built on a person's ability, character, and track record. If there is this constant track record of, I forgive them and then they hurt me, I forgive them and they hurt me, can I tell you, it's okay to say, I'm going to forgive them, I'm going to settle, and I'm going to move on, right? Th th that's okay to be able to recognize, you know what, I'm going to forgive, but if I try to step back into a relationship, I'm only setting myself up for greater pain. God does not want you to step into a relationship where you are going to be harmed, there, there's a freedom and a release in this. So, so hear me. If it's an abusive relationship, God does not want you to put yourself in harm's way, whether that's verbal, emotional, mental, sexual abuse, if that's even, or for your children. God, God is not telling you, hey, forgive and reconcile and make yourself vulnerable to the pain and the attack of what could come again. That is not the heart of the Lord for your life. So to determine whether or not you should reconcile. You can forgive and pray. And say, Lord, do a work in that. But that doesn't mean you have to step into relationship again and make yourself vulnerable and try to walk and trust for them again. So make that determination. If you go, you know what? I can trust this person long term. What they did, yeah, it hurt, but we can move past this. So the fifth step is this. Make the next move regardless of who made the wrong move. Make the next move regardless of who made the wrong move. So that means you make the phone call, you initiate, you step out. And then we start in the process of reconciliation. Step six, affirm the importance of the relationship. The heart of Jesus is reconciliation, right? So you're going to lean in, and the first part of that conversation is, I want you to know we're here because I love you. We're here because I love this relationship that we're talking because I want healing here. And I know that there has been some tension and, and it, there's some weight that I have carried from things that have been done. But I'm not here uh, uh, to, to, uh, to bash you. I'm not here to, I'm here to uh, love you first and to work towards reconciliation. So you affirm the relationship. Step seven. There's nine steps in case you're wondering where we're going. 19 steps. I'm just kidding. I'm not making up 10 more on the spot. I don't have 10 to make up on the spot. Own your slice of the pie. Here's the deal. I, in the whole of the pie, 5% of it may be yours. If you got 5% to own, own it. It will go a long ways in mending the relationship and reconciliation. And if we are given the ministry of reconciliation, this is a part of the process. It is the humility act in, in reconciliation, where there's a humbling that has to happen. You go, you know what? I can own my portion. You don't have to define it. You don't have to be like, listen, I've done some calculating in the hurt and the pain, and I'm going to own my 3.5% of this problem. If you'll own your 98.5% of the problem, right? That's, that's not how we do this. But we just say, I see where I messed up. I, I responded incorrectly. I, I retaliated to the actions that you did. I, I, whatever the case would be. Own your slice of the pie. We are not perfect. And then, and when you own it, offer a sincere apology. But that goes a long ways in reconciling, where you go, hey, I got that wrong. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? Step eight, point out any actions that harmed you. So remain calm and kind, all right? We can speak truth and love, amen? Truth and love, that's yes, that's yes. That's how Jesus did it. So let's do it that way. That Jesus is a great, another great model for us in that. So we wanna be like Jesus, this is part of it. We can point out what happened. It's not wrong for us to just go, hey, what you said there, this is what you said. Man, that hurt. Uh, when you did this, the, the, the way your, your, the body posture in this or, or, or what you did and how you, how you treated my kid, or da, 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 whatever the case may be, you can own those things. You can say, hey, I just need, I need you to know this. This is where the tension is lying. This is what has caused our, our, our problems between us. And so I'm going to point that out and I'm going to tell you I'm doing this out of love. Again, we're affirming that relationship, which we'll do again in, in step nine, but focus on behaviors, not possible motives. So what are behaviors? Things that we can see with our senses. I heard you say this. I saw you do this. And not, I think you did this because. 
you did this because you have a problem with da 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 da, -da with me. It, well, that's a possible motive. We don't know that. You, you, can't, you can't know unless they have said those things directly, right? So we're going to focus on behaviors, not possible motives. That becomes a spiral that gets out of control in a hurry. And it does not lean into reconciliation. And then in that step, be quick to accept, uh, be quick to forgive even a poor apology. And hear me, hear me, you, you, you may in your mind know they didn't mean that. But if the heart is reconciliation in this matter, simply accepting even a poor apology will go a long ways. And it may be just the subtlety that gets the relationship moving back in the right direction. If we've determined this is a worthy, worthwhile endeavor to reconcile this relationship, we'll just quick to forgive even a poor apology. Have you been in that situation before? I have. I've been the one giving the poor apology before. And I'm thankful when people accepted it. And I'm like, huh, I half meant that, right? And you've been in those and you're like, I, you know, it's really funny watching children. You know, like, tell your brother you're sorry. I'm sorry. He meant that from the deep in his soul. We've all done it. I was the brother at one point in time. My mom would be like, tell your sister, sorry. sorry. Like, yes. Mm. That felt. And then, of course, little sister goes, you didn't mean that. I'm like, you don't know that. I'm like, yes, I do. I'm like, all right. You're right. Be quick to forgive even a poor apology. And then step nine affirm the importance of the relationship. And you're like, we already did that. Yeah, it's good to start and end the same way. I love you. I want this to work. I believe in this relationship. And we still have work ahead of us. And, and I know things may be a little bit tense for a little bit and awkward as we move forward from here, but I want you to know this is worth it. I, I'm, I'm willing to fight for this. Affirm the relationship. Affirm the relationship. And you say, what do I do in a relationship where I have no opportunity for reconciliation? It's a great question. Maybe they've passed away. Or maybe they've cut you off and they won't have conversation with you. They won't talk to you. All you have to do is go through steps one through three. Forgive. And then skip down a little bit. to a step that's not written and take it to the Lord. Say, God, help me to reconcile with you. Let me own the slice of my pie before you. Lord, this is where I messed up. I'm owning that. And then, Lord, let my heart then be reconciled before you in this relationship. If they've passed away, then you can make peace to say, God, I didn't get that relationship right. I didn't let it end well. And now they've gone. I don't have the opportunity for reconciliation. The Lord says, hey, we can still walk in forgiveness in a matter for somebody that is no longer with us. And then he also says, and then we can be reconciled here. So that now when we see, you know, or, or think of them as lost or as gone or a relationship that is no longer able to be salvaged or saved because they've cut you off or they've, they've blocked your number and they've, they've written you off or whatever, you can still reconcile before the Lord. So that when you do at some point cross paths with them, there's not this bitterness and this anger that is living present because of past things. But you go, you know what? I have forgiven them. I've been reconciled before the Lord. You say, God, you know my heart. Help me to reconcile, even if I don't have the opportunity to have conversation, so that we can walk in love. They will know that we are his disciples by how we love one another. This morning, I'll invite Peyton to join me. Relationships are tricky. Family relationships are really tricky. It, it, it just, it elevates. It moves to another. There is a depth of love there. And, and, and you, you, you know this, that no one but your family can hurt you like anyone but family. Sometimes they know, just because they know the right things to say. The biggest arguments in my life have been with my sisters. <laughs> the biggest arguments of my adult life have been with my sisters. 
And y'all are probably thinking, well, you're all pastors. You have wonderful, calm, quiet Christmases, and it's beautiful. I'll tell you a little bit about me. I hold things in until I get to the point to where I can no longer hold it in. And, and, and I, I, I don't practice good practice in, in having like, you know, this pressure release valve where I'm like, hey, we need to talk a little bit before this. And I just let it like, I'm like the, the Coke bottle just, and then I find it's like, and they're like, there goes Christmas. Ryan, Ryan just, last year was a great Christmas, in case anybody's wondering. This is not, this is not recent memory history. This is, because there's no step in the process. One, I'm not going to the Lord and being like, God, let me walk in a heart of forgiveness towards him. And so there's the challenge in the first place to say, God, let my heart be postured for forgiveness. If I want to love like Jesus, let me walk in a posture of forgiveness and, and let my heart be yielded towards him in forgiveness. And then I, I'm not taking the steps to reconcile. I'm not taking the steps to say, hey, you don't even know this, but I've carried unforgiveness towards you and, and, and I've asked the Lord to help me in this. And, and I want you to know that I, I have forgiveness in this, but here's how I recognize I messed up, right? I've not walked these steps until it's a little after the fact. And then now, yes, I'm just in case, I don't wanna leave it open-ended. I am reconciled with my sisters in a very good way right now. And it, we have a wonderful, wonderful relationship. But, but I've had these moments, right? Where if I would have just simply applied and walked this out, I would have saved our entire family heartache. I would have made a, a few Christmases less tense. I would have made a, a Thanksgiving less frustrating. I would have saved my mom some tears. If I simply would have just said, Lord, I want to forgive and reconcile the way you have called me to forgive and reconcile. If we are called into the ministry of reconciliation, we need to walk this out. And yes, I know today was very practical, but I also understand this, that sometimes the act in the heart of forgiveness is something only done by the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't want to begin to think that we can just formulate, you know, just forgiveness. Like, here's the formula for forgiveness. Do this and da 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 Hear me this morning. You may not be ready to forgive yet. The hurts that have been brought to you, listen, I, I want you to hear me. In those areas... Jesus wants to bring healing. Because your next move may simply be leaning into the healing power and the work of the Holy Spirit for your heart and for your mind. To say, Lord, help me. I think about Joseph. Joseph, the son of Jacob, later Israel, he, he is has this dream and he goes before his brothers and he says, y'all are all gonna bow down to me and we'll shorten the story real fast. And, and they go, we don't like that. And he's like, no, mom, dad, everybody, listen, you're gonna bow down to me. And, and they're like, this isn't, no, we don't like this. And so anger builds up in the brothers, right? What do they do? They're gonna kill him, but they decide, oh, you know what? Here's opportunity. They sell him into slavery. And he goes through this whole process through, through the house of Potiphar and he ends up in prison and, and ultimately ends up as second in command of all of Egypt. And you know, you know that there was some serious hurt and some wounds deep in his heart as he's having to realize and reconcile the fact that his own family casts him out, sells him into slavery, and he's living in the depths of the pain of realizing I'm being an outcast from my family. Famine strikes the land. His family is without food, and, and they hear there's food in Egypt. Jacob says, boys, go. Get us food. We're going to die. We're going to become destitute, is what he says. And they go, and Joseph sees him, and he realizes, those are my brothers. Those are my brothers. He said, for years, for years, I lived as a servant. And then I was thrown into prison. For years I lived in prison because of what they did to me. I can only imagine the thoughts and the hurt that he's living with and that he's walking in as he's sitting in prison waiting just for a moment. God, will you ever get me out of here? Remember me. Remember me before Pharaoh. And finally the moment he's pulled up, he's brought out, and he's standing then face to face with his brothers. I can only imagine the thoughts and the hurt and the pain as he's looking at them and he's going, I have written you out of my life. And the first time we see him, it's not, he, he's not super cordial and warm. He's wrestling with some emotion. He's, he's battling some things and he says, he hears that his, his little brother is still alive and he goes, okay, fine then. 
He's like, bring my dad, bring my brother back, bring him back here. I'm going to hold one of you. I'm going to hold you here. And hold you. To the point that finally there is this breaking. And we see that Joseph is weeping before his brothers. Yeah, or he goes around the court. He's hiding. He's, he doesn't want to be seen in the brokenness. And he is weeping, broken. You know what happens is I believe in that moment that God brings in some healing in some realization. Listen, I, I, I don't want to try to over-spiritualize every hurt or pain that you've walked through because there are some that, 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 man, the enemy wants to use to bring you down and destroy. But here's what we see with Joseph. Joseph finally comes at this point in this healing, in this walk, in this process where he comes to them face to face and he has this moment of being able to forgive and he says, what, 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 the, what the devil, what the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. That for some of you, you're in a place that you are in desperate need of healing from the pain that you have walked through, from, from the hurts that you have endured. And, and the Lord is saying, listen, there's good of this. There's good that will come. And it may not be easy to see right now. It may not be easy to see how, how God wants to set you up through all of this. It may not be easy to see what the Lord wants to turn this into in the beautiful masterpiece that he's creating, that he's working. And it may have to begin with a moment of healing where the Lord comes in and says, let me just heal and restore your heart. Let me heal and restore your mind so then you can step into a place of forgiveness and begin to love like Jesus. And, and, and maybe the relationship doesn't need to be reconciled, but maybe it does. Maybe it's like this great moment with Joseph and his family where finally he just says, oh, y'all need to come here. You need to come and be with me. We have what you need. I have the resources. I can care for you. And then Pharaoh puts him in the best of the land of Goshen. And then he's, you know, there's this incredible moment of reconciliation of the work. And it doesn't happen in Joseph's own ability and his own power. It is an act of God. And you may be in a place today where you have walked through some traumatic hurt and pain in your life. And what I have learned, it's not always the case. Most of the time, the deepest hurt you experience and carry is from family. And so when we say family matters, all it does is trigger the pain. When we say family matters, all it does is cause you to go, family's a joke. We're like, family matters. And you're like, yeah, maybe, maybe my four people that live in my house I don't care about anybody else that calls me family. And so the first thing that I, I, I want to ask and that we want to lean into, and I'm going to invite our, our, our small group leaders and elders that are present in the room to come forward and, and staff to be present to, to begin to pray. Because we want to pray, first of all, for emotional healing and for, for healing in the mind and the thoughts that, that, that you carry and that you walk with, that it is a heavy, heavy weight. And before you can even step in to begin to pray for forgiveness, to the heart of forgiveness. You need healing. And then from there, the second thing we want to ask is that God, give us a heart of forgiveness towards them. Give us a heart of forgiveness towards the ones that have hurt us and wronged us here first before we can even step forward into reconciliation. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. And after I pray, if you're in either camp, and I, 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 would, I would ask that you let the ones praying with you just say, hey, I'm either here for, for healing for emotional, mental healing, or I'm up here for forgiveness. Or maybe the Holy Spirit's been talking to you about something totally different and off the wall, and what he has said to you is far better than anything I said this morning, and you're going, I just need to pray in this. If you'll come, we just want to pray with you. We want to have the opportunity to respond to the Lord and let the Holy Spirit do a work that we can never manufacture. So Father, in the name of Jesus, God, as we deal with hurt, as we deal with relationships, as we deal with the pain that comes. Lord, this morning I know that there are those standing in this room or watching online who are living with deep wounds. And even talking about it this morning, maybe perhaps, Lord, it feels like wounds have been opened again and there's a, a refresh of the pain that they have walked through and endured as, as thoughts have played through their mind, Lord, and they're going, how am I supposed to forgive this? And Lord, this morning I pray that by the work of your Holy Spirit that you begin to draw our hearts to a place that says, God, first of all, give healing. And then, Lord, Give us a heart to forgive in Jesus' name.